So this is Hacking Your Home. Uh, horrible title because that made all people come here. I didn't include IoT because that would be cheating. So if any one of you are here to learn how to break in an entry into homes, I am sorry, but you have been misled. This talk has nothing to do with that. So, but that also means that anybody that you see leaving, take a picture because we know who the burglars around here are. All right, so I'm Carl Henrik Nilsson. I'm a coder, I'm a speaker, and first and foremost, I'm a huge nerd. But people call it geek because it sounds better. I work for 1337. I'm a Microsoft MVP, and I've been doing this for almost 15 years. Well, the six first of those, I was designing and building mobile base stations for radio communication and phone communication. And I would suggest that you listen to none of that because it doesn't really important. What is important is that I know how to do this stuff. And to kind of prove that to you, my fellow geeks, I would like to present to you my office. I have been interested in hardware hacking since I was seven years old. At least my parents claim so. Because I got a hold of a metal scissor and directly decided to cut off the electrical cord for my mother's favorite lamp. <laughs> I survived, and I, I guess something of it stuck because I've been interested in electronics ever since. And I've done quite a lot with it. I built communication systems, IoT systems. I worked with it for almost 10 years, and I worked in a lot of different industries for this. But I've never done anything more fun than the project that I'm going to tell you about right now. And this is kind of like the project that got me started building really big solutions, not just, you know, kind of like fun, small project, but actually kind of like doing something real. Uh, but I'm going to get back to that. I just wanted to kind of like set you off on the, the right mood here. So think about wireless communication. How old is wireless communication? I mean, if you talk about network communication or computer communication, you think about your first LAN party, right? Where you went with the BNC connectors and the hub that when somebody's mom called, you, they kind of disconnected and, and doom or whatever you were running. and said, who disconnected? And you had to kind of like find the adapters and all that stuff and make it work again. And that's actually quite new. I mean, even if we go back to something like the telegraph, that's a wired connection. But their counterpart, the Indians, were using wireless communication because they're using the same thing, but with smoke. So I mean, we always had kind of like a need to do wireless communication from the very, very first beginning. It's just today, it is binary stuff and it's data stuff that we want to communicate with. And for that reason, today I'm going to tell you how you can reverse engineer all your wireless home appliances. Like, in this example, I'm going to use one of these Nexa power controllers. I'm going to demonstrate to you how you can figure out how to use the remote for your own devices, and how you can control these from your own devices. And then, how you can use that knowledge to transmit or, or to reverse engineer almost anything in your home that has a wireless communication device and is not cryptated. Sounds good? Yeah. Awesome. So. Three reasons more for why you should do this. This is extremely useful for home automation if you don't want to actually buy into a specific ecosystem. So today we have C-Wave, we have Zigbee, we have RS-433, we have so many different variations of home automation systems. Like, I think I've been advertised four different systems from four different security deliverers in the last few weeks because there's so many systems available. And we can do, the thing that we could do with this is we can select the best parts that we want. Like we could buy into one of them, use most of that stuff, then just reverse engineer the things we actually want to use, connect something else to that, and just get the functions that we were missing, and be able to actually have a system that our wives will not hate us for having. But it's also a very learning experience. I think I learned almost everything I know about user experience from my wife or girlfriend. We're not married yet, but we're married in the Swedish sense. We own a house together. <laughs> so I went into this project with kind of like a lot of problems, things that I didn't actually were able to do and things that I wasn't actually able to overpass. And then I had a colleague and he's 
kind of like suggesting, well, have you tried this? Have you tried that? And you go like, no. And I mean, those are the best days. Those are so fun. Those are so amazing because somebody tells you this small little fragment of information that's just that, that little missing puzzle piece. And suddenly everything is fun. Everything is amazing. And you just, you just use all your flex time hours for a day's vacation. You go home and you, you hack out some hardware and some code. And it's, it's better than anything. It's better than, it's better than sex. <laughs> And it's so amazing when you actually get it to work. But that's not what I'm here to talk about. I'm here to talk about reverse engineering. But do know that if you start with this, you will have an office like mine within a few months. Peter is well on his way. And you will probably also have a lot of fun. You will learn a lot of things from this. But I'd like to talk to you a little bit about dark, hate, problems, Death. I'd like to talk about commuting in northern Sweden. This is actually snow for those of you who come from southern Sweden. <laughs> so this story starts when I was going to work. I woke up and it was minus 38 degrees, which is actually not that uncommon in January, northern Sweden. And I got out to my car with some effort. And after a while, when I came to the parking lot, I shoveled up all the snow and I was able to access my slightly frosty car. And I, it, it felt like it looked like this. And I kind of like, I hacked my way into the car, just trying to get into it. And for some amazing reason, it actually started. You know, with a <laughs> And suddenly you actually got it running. And then I discovered that my car manufacturer, for some reason, thought that, hey, you know what would be an awesome property for a steering wheel? What if it can conduct cold really well? <laughs> Not the brightest thing. But I got a car started, I put the heating on, you know, max, and just drove down the highway to my job, my office. So <laughs> of all those, it sounds like that, like a tractor almost. And I went down the road and I saw an, a sign, an apparition, or actually uh, just a sign. And it said, are you tired of a cold car? Like, yes, yes I am. I am tired of a cold car. And the, the second sign said, we install car heaters for 500 euros. Like, no booking, just drive in. I did one of those, you know, American kind of like turn things, but just drove ro straight in. Yeah, I want a car heater. Just put it in there. I sat in their cafeteria working that day for like two hours while they installed the stuff. I went to my office. I plugged it in, and it started going like, with this warm, heated godness of warmth. And if you haven't actually been minus 38 degrees cold, you probably cannot fathom this, but it is an amazing feeling of getting this warmth. And I went in, I worked for the entire day, I came out to a warm car, and I just kind of snickered and laughed as I walked by all the other cars covered in snow and ice, and I felt so good. Then I came home, and I plugged in this car, and I realized that, wait a minute, it's minus 38, that's a lot of energy. I need to heat up my car, that's also a lot of energy. And at my office, they're paying for it. But here, wait, that's me paying for it. That's not good. So I talked to my girlfriend about how can we solve this? Like, this is a problem. And she's like, well, you just set your alarm early and get up and start it. And I'm like, I'm a developer. 5 a.m. is a concept that I know nothing about. It's like, what are you talking about? It doesn't exist. And she were like, well, you could check the weather channel and set a timer. I could do that. I know how to check the weather channel. So I checked the weather channel for like one day, and apparently metrologists are not always right. Have you heard about this concept? It's really strange, but sometimes they are actually wrong. It's very odd. So a lot of the times, it's actually the car was either too cold or I used too much energy, and I just didn't really like it. 
And I've also at the time, I've got a weather station from my girlfriend as a Christmas gift. And this had very exact temperature readings. And there are formulas that you can use to figure out like how quick, when do I need to turn on my car heater to actually make it warm enough, warm and toasty, to me, depending on the temperature. So I wanted to read that temperature into a system that would then turn on the car heater. Quite simple. The problem was that I had a girlfriend. Have a girl, I have a girlfriend, we're still... <laughs> so far, yeah. She hasn't seen my office. Now, anyway, so, and she went to me and said like, okay, fine. She really did, you know, this, have you seen this hand movement? Fine, fine, you can do this. You can do this if it always works. It's like, what do you think I am, Apple? It always works. That was one of her conditions. It must always work. I don't want to see any cables. All right. And you are not allowed to destroy the weather station. It's like she knows me. <laughs> so I figured out with a few questions. And the first one, like, how will I activate it? And that's quite simple. You can use one of these Nexus, which is where I kind of figured out, okay, so I need to reverse engineer one of these. That's kind of where I started off. So that's what we're going to talk about next. But of course, I also reverse engineered a wireless uh, weather station reading device. So we're going to talk a little bit about how that is solved and how I use that to actually start my car heater. Now, I know that there's at least two people in this room who would like to say this to me at the moment. Right? Yeah, that's one of them. And this was a lot of years ago. And it was supposed to work in minus 40, which very few of them does. So it wasn't actually feasible back then. We didn't have the Raspberry Pis. We didn't have all the stuff that we have today. And also, there's no chance in hell I would forego this opportunity to actually build something like this. This is too, just too much fun. But I just like to avoid that question in the end. <laughs> so after. I decided to do this. I, I kind of started asking myself questions like, what am I going to do? How am I going to solve this? And one of the first questions that I had like, what is going to control this? And while I could have put a computer there, a microprocessor is so much more efficient to do this. In my case, I use a Soacris or x86 PC with Linux on it. But today, I would probably have used a Raspberry Pi. I mean, today, you could have even you could run like Raspberry Pi, and you could even pick your favorite operating system. Uh, you could do universal apps or Linux apps or Python or actually whatever you like on them. So it's actually very, very easy to do this step today. And then I needed a sensor. In this case, I had the weather station. And there is actually a number of weather stations that are quite easily reverse engineers. But so if you kind of like get inspired and like, I'm going to do this, I'm going to build this when you go home. Klaus Olsson has it. It's a small box from Parallax, 99 Swedish crowns. Very easy to use. Code is on GitHub. But I figured out that I'm going to need a sensor, so, but I had the sensor, so that's fine. And the activator. And the activator was actually kind of not a really logical choice, because you had to find something that would work outdoors. And as luck would have it, right at that time, Nexus re released an outdoor-approved version of their power controller. So they're still around, and you can use it if you want to do something outside. So it was a whew, big relief. Now, like, don't get me wrong, you do not have to do what I did. I would, in fact, suggest that you do something else, because that means that I can go on GitHub and find code for your stuff. I'm lazy, so that's nice. But you can do anything like this, really. I mean, you can use kids' toys, you can do meat thermometers, you can do smart light bulbs, remote controls. I had a guy talk to yesterday. He's like, yeah, I had the stereo in a different room. Could I emulate a, a remote control? Of course you can. It's not even hard. Well, that's the beauty of this. When you can actually learn how to look at a binary protocol and actually mimic a binary protocol, you can mimic almost anything that's not cryptated or has reverse step keychain or something like that. But it's actually quite simple for most of this cheaper stuff. Slight disclaimer. So, the rest of these things are not going to be true, but they're going to be true enough so that you'll actually get the point. So, my first question in this, when I came around, is how do they communicate? And as you can probably see, I'm a quite of a babbly guy, I talk too much. 
So I made a talk about this. So I made a talk about, I talked about all these technical details, like how does frequency shift keying works, and how do this combine with amplitude shift keying, and all that stuff, and I talked about it for a long time. And that was probably my first kind of introduction to how do you actually do a software talk. Because afterwards, a guy comes up to me and says, like, yeah, I didn't get anything of that. All right, so I had to kind of figure out a way. We were in this big office environment with lots and lots of cool people, and I'm, I'm standing there going like, all right, all right, all right, all right. So frequency shift keying is when you amplitude the frequency to encode data. Think of it like this. Zero. One. Zero. One. And he went like, oh, all right, and amplitude shift keying is when you just use the amplitude, so it's like zero, one, zero, one. Like you, kinda like ha you can't overdo that, because you guys are going to get a problem with your ears. But. So you guys also see the difference? This is pretty good, I think, to actually just make the point. And this is, uh, amplitude shift keying is today very uncommon. Today is almost always frequency shift keying, because it's cheaper and easier to build for most aspects, and it doesn't use as much band bandwidth. And that always costs money, so it saves money. And as we all know, if we save money, we do less stuff. But I did do, as I was actually standing in a quite large office, screaming, one! Didn't work all that well. All right, so to actually reverse an inerdium, we're going to need three things. We're going to need something to listen to you know, all the stuff that we wanted to, like something to listen to. In this case, we're going to listen to this remote control for the next device. We're going to need something to listen with. And while there are, like, a huge amount of things we could have used, like software-defined radio stuff, we could have used actual radios, we could have used stuff that are designed to actually use reverse engineering. I'm going to demonstrate this with a 1.2 Swedish crown frequency uh, FM receiver just because I wanted to be shown how extremely easy you can actually do this. Now, to pick one of these, because these just come in one frequency, to pick one of these, you have to figure out which frequency your toy is on. And that is an extremely complicated thing that I'm going to demonstrate now, so pay attention. Pay attention. All right, I'm going to move up, because this is actually really hard. So what you do is, you take the control of the item that you want to reverse engineer, and you turn it over, and you read on the back. <laughs> so on the back you will have a sticker, this is mandated throughout the European Union that it has to tell which frequency it's actually transmitting on. So it's extraordinarily simple. I mean hard, I mean hard. Okay, third thing we're going to need is something to record with. And for that I would of course be able to recommend you a $2,000 oscilloscope, awesome thing or a $800 um, signal, I don't even remember the, the name right now, logic analyzer, sorry, thank you, there we go. Or, if you want to be like that, we could use the chip, they just demonstrate, and a $10 sound card also works. I mean, it's going to be a lot easier to use a logic analyzer, because they're built for this. I mean, you can just hook them up, and you can get all the binary packages, you can just get a dump of how the data works. So if you have too much money, feel free to get one. They are a lot of fun. But if you just want to try it out, see how it works, a $10 sound card and this chip will work perfectly fine. Uh, and if you feel like actually doing this, so and you download my slides, there is hidden slides with the how you actually do the soldering and how you connect it and do all that stuff. So I thought about you guys. I got you covered. Uh, and to, to connect to this, you can actually build an Oslo, oscilloscope of your computer. So there's software that you can download, and they will become an oscilloscope. It's quite nice. And this will mean that you can just use them, and you'll get all the binary stuff, and you can actually get a lot of the functions from a logic analyzer in your computer from a sound card. It's very, very good to kind of like start out with. But they require that you know a little bit about oscilloscopes. So I'm going to demonstrate using Audacity. An open source thing, runs on Linux, runs on Windows, any computer. So you need a $10 sound card, an open source software, and a 1.2 Swedish crown device for listening. So let's do a quick demo of that. OK. 
See the screen? Yeah, good. Amazingly high resolution. So what we're doing here is that, I'm just going to zoom in for you, want you guys, because I can't see anything. All right, here we go. So this is actually what you're looking for. You're going to have like a blank line if you've done it correctly. Um, now we can have some disturbances, so we're probably not going to have really perfectly square-shaped signals when I go into that, because, well, every one of you is carrying a device that is transmitting a signal, which is somehow m messing up my signals. But so don't do this in a room with like 200 people with cell phones. It's, it's not a good idea. But what you're looking for is kind of like these bursts of noise that you see here. This means that you got something. When you push a button, if you, when you push the button and you actually get these kind of data bursts, that's when you know you got something. Let's zoom in on that a little bit. Let's take, let's take that one. I think that looks better. So there we go. Yeah. So we zoom in on this. We see lovely square-shaped signals, slightly distorted by people with cell phones and computers. And this is data. That's the odd part. And this is enough to actually figure this out. So what you do here, I'm going to zoom in for you a little bit. Didn't I turn on zoom it? Probably not. There we go. So what we have here is is data points. And these actually are, as they are sound recordings, but Audacity is excellent in actually telling us how long they are. So we can start measuring our sound, our data waves, and we can do like this, and we can look at, mm -hmm. oh. we can do like this, and we will see the sample amount we want. All right. Apparently, we won't. Wait, just give me a second. There we go. Oh, for fuck's sake, zoom it. All right, you have to take my word for it that here, you can probably see it pretty well. It says 11 samples. And since we know that we have listened with a sound device in 44,100 hertz, it is quite easy to figure out that one second divided by 44,100 times 11 is the time that this signal was active. All right, so that's something that we know now. Not much, but as we walk through this new little data thing that we have here, we see that they are very seldomly differ from 11. In fact, they never differ from 11 more than with maybe one because you know they're not that good. It's made in China or something like that. So that's odd because how do you encode data in signals that are never, ever, ever different? Anyone know? I'll throw you a t-shirt if you can answer this question. All right. Very good. You got a t-shirt. So that's true. So then the data is encoded, in fact, in the entire length of this. So these data blips actually demonstrate to us that, hi, this is new data coming. So in this case, we can traverse this and see that, OK, so this is probably a long bit, and this is a short bit. So we have 250 microseconds of data here, and we have 250 microseconds of nothing, a flat wave. So that means that we can go through this and figure out that, okay, so the first one is one, and this one is a zero, the next one is a one, and the next one is a zero, and so forth. And it's very easy to calculate this, like I said. It's one second divided by 44,100 hertz times the number of samples. Got it? Awesome. So, just the mathematical formulas, you want to return to it. There is more text in the actual demonstration how you can do this. Um, but 
when I did this and when I traversed this, it was very odd because I discovered that there were four different types of data bits, not two. And that's very odd because I know binary, and binary is one, it's like zero or one. Okay, so apparently there's something more going on here. And this is one of the things where I told you what one of, one of my colleagues that were really good at this, so I talked to him, but dude, think, think computers, it's a header. It tells them that something starts. It felt very stupid, but yeah, okay. So the first one, like if you have, in this case, we're looking at the first significant bit. We only had one of those. So yeah, it makes sense, it's a start bit. The second one, the long one, well, in this case, I'm saying it's a one, and I could very well be wrong. It could be a zero, but since I'm only interested in trying to kind of figure out the data, it makes a lot of sense that I could probably be shouting actual reverse of what I think I'm shouting to this device, but probably not because I'm going to demonstrate a little bit later how I kind of came to that conclusion. And this, of course, is the zero bit. So we have the start bit, which after we do the formula that I talked about, I discovered that this was 250 microseconds of an actual pulse, and then nothing for 2,500 microseconds. Then I had the one bit, which was 250 microseconds and 1,250 microseconds, and a zero bit that was just 250 and 250. And as soon as I got the information, I could use that to write some code. So the thing about this, just let me go into this. Uh, let's see. It's a C program, starting down. So the thing about this that we did was just a simple ID mask and a bit shifting to get the stuff going. All this code is on GitHub, so you don't have to you know, kind of figure it out now. I'll be happy to explain stuff like this, but I don't feel like going into low-level C code. And you can do this with actually any microprocessor. I was hoping to actually do this on C Sharp with the Raspberry Pi 2, but I didn't really have the time yesterday because I was drinking beer. <laughs> I'm honest, okay? But the point that I'm trying to do is, is actually quite simple. As soon as you figure that out, you can look at all these binary tickets that we have here. Okay, so we looked at all the binary packages, and we figured out that, okay, so, we have the length of the binary trail, how much binary do we need to send. We know what they say. So suddenly we have enough information to actually mimic the remote. So from that point, we can pretend to be the remote. We does not yet know what the remote wants to say, but we can actually pretend to be the remote. All right? So this is when we start pushing different buttons. So this button has one, two, and three, and group. So what, we, what I did was I started pushing one, and I saw what I got. I wrote a small software that just looks for all these bits and just dropped the binary string. Pushed one, looked what I got. Pushed two, looked what I got. What was the difference? Okay, so it's a different code. The last part is the same, the first part is different. Okay, so it's different codes. This is where code settings are. Then you use the group one. Okay, it's a different code, but also something else changes. The last two bits, which was the group bits. So you can kind of like puzzle through all the buttons, if you have a remote, it's actually very, very simple to do this. You can puzzle through all the binary strings and kind of like figure out the, the protocol. And that's what we did, and that's what you see here in the FFFC0. We're actually just trying to build the package of this. So let me, let me give you a quick demo, show that it actually works before we walk through this. So in this case, I'm using an, an Arduino. Um, so it also ha it has a small serial parser just to be able to send some commands and do some demos. So if we send on, it turns on the lamp. Now what we actually did was that we used this small that I showed you before. FM transmitter. And we figured out what the control was saying to be able to mimic it. So now that we can mimic it, that was all that I needed for that part. Like I wanted it to turn on my car heater. So I just needed to mimic it. But 
once we actually had that, it was quite easy to start and just playing around with it, just making a lot of codes and see what worked with these. And we figured out that while Nexa ships these with three options, you can have 256 of these in your home if you write your own stuff. Because you have, that's like the, the address space you actually have available. And we just figured that out by doing you know, a while loop and see how many codes actually worked. Because as soon as you have the code and on your own computer, it's very, very easy to just you know, play around with it. So you can do 256 of these. You can do every outlet in my house three times over. I don't know why you would want to do that, but you could. <laughs> Just need to see if this actually works. Ah, didn't have that code in it. And as you see here in this code, just going to demonstrate the one bit, zero bit part. It is actually quite simplistic. So the set level is just us setting the level one, because we figured it out, and then we actually send in the time. In this case, we call it T-short and T-long, because you saw the 1,250 microseconds and 250 microseconds. So in the set level, all it actually do, does is look for the polarity, like, is it, are, we gonna, are, we are we done? Should we go down? Or should we go up? Very, very simple. It runs it for the time, and then just waits for the time. So we're not doing anything that's actually in any way impossible for any one of you guys here. You're kind of like, if you took this, you guys could write so much cool stuff with this because you're awesome software developers. Extraordinary simple stuff. And all this code is on GitHub. You can take it and send me emails of how bad it is and just fix it and do a pull request and I'll put your name on my demo. I promise. All right, so there are 10 types of people in the world. People that know binary and people that don't know binary. There is actually 11 types of people in the world because there are also those who make bad jokes about binary. But the thing that also stumped me for a long time with this, with trying to reverse engineer this, was that I didn't get what I thought I was going to get. I got a really, really, really long bit stream. And this is the other part when it was really, really useful to have a 65-year-old colleague. Because he remembered how they did it back in the days. And he's like, well, you know, well, they probably just added a bit to make sure that they don't get any disturbance. I'm like, what? Haven't they heard about checksums? Well, just trust me on this. Just, you know, and he showed me how to do this. So what they do, and if you know checksums, you're going to laugh at this, what they do is that they add a binary one for a zero. So a zero is actually zero one, and a one is one zero. Totally obvious, right? Instead of using a checksum. Awesome. But this is actually have discovered is extremely common, extremely common in these type of devices. Very, very often. And apparently it is because it's faster to do it like this. So when they actually find that, okay, we got one one. We can never get one one. One one is wrong. Okay, so we got one one. What's, just, just throw it away, because you have so much limited power. So you just throw it away and wait for the next start bit. And it actually makes a lot of sense when you figure out that they are actually working with like eight megahertz processors, not one gigahertz like we do, or much more. So they add a zero or a one. So that's not confusing at all, right? No, not. It's very simple. Except that this is very vendor specific. This is how Nexa do it. No, actually, Nexa does it the other way around. Nexa adds a 1 to a 1 and a 0 to a 0. And uh, the EULA one, the Anslut, if you haven't seen it in EULA, it uses the 1, 0, 0, 1 kind of thing. And there are other versions too, but these are the two most common ones. But that's a whole different story. But I think you should need to know about those two because that will get you through like 95% of most of the development systems that you're going to try and reverse engineer. But, so that's the remote control. We figured out remote control, and that was quite simple, because you had something to push, all right? So what about the weather station? The weather station, we had nothing to push. We have no idea when it actually sends data, right? And these are actually quite complicated to figure out. One of the tricks that I used, I'm going to give you a trick. You can 
remember this if you want to, but it's a really good trick. Just remove the battery, because they always sync when you get back into it. As soon as you put the battery back, they sync up and they tell you the values. But you also need to read the value on the display. So it's kind of hard. If it sends one every minute, and you try to log it, try and get all the data, it is very difficult to actually figure out, OK, what data am I getting? What am I getting? So the thing that we did was that we figured out what it was transmitting at a fixed amount of humidity. Because humidity doesn't have decimal points. A decimal point can be encoded in very many different ways. Quite often, they are encoded as just a multiple of 1,000. But there are very many different ways. So we wanted to figure out the binary system before we actually figured out what way they wanted to do the dotting. So what did we do? Well, are there any other people that actually needs fixed humidity? Any smokers? So we found, found a cigar box which had a built-in humid. We could set the exact humid on it. We could just tested. it. We just put it in there and waited. And we just logged all the data. So we waited until we found this kind of bit string. And when we figured out that, we know how it was encoded, because we could translate this to this. But that's kind of also when you start reversing there. You have to think about it. Think outside the box, because you cannot just sit around and do just waiting and hoping. OK, got data. Let's see. OK, it says 23.9. I write around 23.9. And sooner or later, you're going to like, look like Rain Man with papers all over your apartment. And like, oh, what was it? 23.9 was OK, 0111100. Zero, one, 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 zero, zero, zero. It's, like, it, it's, it's madness. Figure out a structural way to do this and a way to actually test your hypotheses. In the case of humidity, cigar boxes work wonderful. So for roughly 10 Swedish crowns, $10, you can easily do this. You can easily replicate it. If you need any of the data of the schematics, the software, and all of those links and everything will be in the presentation in hidden slides just for your enjoyment. There's also a shopping list if you like want to go out and buy the stuff and figure out so it's all there. And of course, you can always contact me and talk about me at these pings. Now, for the burglars. Why is this actually useful for burglars? Could you actually use this technology to hack a home? Lock systems do not use this system, so lock systems are out. But this has actually been used. I was informed about this by one guy at the conference I was at. This has actually been used to break into homes. So what they did was they went around with a computer and a pretty good antenna and just recorded all of the wireless power adapters. So people that had power adapters turned on in their homes, they would just you know, go for vacation and leave them on. And they would drive by and turn them off. If you were home, you'd turn them on again. Well, that's a strange glitch. But if you weren't home, suddenly it was dark. It's like the event handler of, is people home or not? Let's break in. All right, you have been a wonderful audience, and I would like to thank you all for listening to me. Uh, there's five minutes and f four minutes and 50 seconds left, so if you want to take any questions, I'll be happy to answer them for that time. You can find me on Twitter, and this is my blog. Thanks for listening. <laughs>